Well, good afternoon and welcome to the four o'clock session. It's always a blessing to be here at four o'clock. I must have uh, done something wrong to have a four o'clock session. Uh, it's an interesting, an interesting day to talk about legal issues. Uh, today's topic is, is my F&I uh, bulletproof? You know, F&I has always been considered one of the most profitable departments within a dealership when you consider the square footage allocated to a finance and insurance department. However, uh, probably as my friend Tom might say, it's also probably the uh, most litigious department within the entire dealership. Uh, I think when we look at all the issues that occur legally and when customers want to take us to court, I'm not quite convinced they take us to, uh, they'll win in court on the automotive issue, the car itself, but they get us on our paper issue. So these issues are rather important, and I do commend you, you for being here this afternoon at 4 o'clock when you think about other things to do. There's nothing as important as where you are right now, however. I want to introduce your uh, panel to you. Uh, we have uh, Pat McPherson, National Director of Strategic uh, Accounts with uh, Route 1. Pat? Uh, we have uh, Corby Swick, who is the Vice President of Sales for uh, Pro Credit Express. And Promax. Did I screw that up? No. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Chip uh, Zavaluski, Senior Attorney in Direct uh, Lending, uh, Walters Kluwer. And I want to assure you, as uh, Tom and Pat have said, uh, according to federal law, uh, size really doesn't matter. Uh, I think about all the uh, comments I've heard over the years, especially even teaching the CMD course, uh, dealers who say, well, we're really small, we're out in the middle of nowhere, who's going to bother us? And uh, I would rather encourage you that, and like I've always told my students at Northwood, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to stop at stop signs. You don't have to pay your bills. You don't have to do anything. You just have to take the consequences when, you know, when you're caught. And I think that's the way we have to uh, kind of remind ourselves, you don't have to do anything. Uh, it's a beautiful thing about living in this country. We're not forced to do anything. But you just have to be forced to do the consequences afterwards. So uh, I'd like to start the panel. Uh, this panel is this is yours and it's theirs. Basically what I like to do is just kind of keep things on track uh, for the next 45 minutes. But uh, Pat, why don't you kick us off? Oh, thank you, Mr. Lascota, and, and thanks for having me this afternoon. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And I really love the topic, is your F&I bulletproof? And I want to start really by kind of engaging you for a second. And by show of hands, can, uh, would you raise your hand if you hold the title in your organization of compliance officer? Got a few hands. Uh, those of you that did not raise your hand, do you know who your compliance officer is in the dealership? The same hands. <laughs> well, I can tell by the show of hands or the lack of show of hands that uh, you're probably not bulletproof. And if you, if you take a look at the dictionary definition of bulletproof, I mean, it's quite simply, you know, it's capable of resisting or absorbing the impact of a bullet. Well, that works great for the Marines, but there's another definition that talks about bulletproof meaning safe from failure or without errors. And I don't think anybody in this room could say they're completely immune. So if, if you will agree for, with me for a second that you in fact probably are not bulletproof, what I hope to do in the next couple of minutes is give you a little roadmap on how to become more bulletproof, if that's at all possible. But as you all know, you know, bullets are coming from everywhere. It's an alphabet soup of regulation out there. You've got you know, TILA, Reg Z, CLA, you know, you've got Reg M, ECOA, you know, FACTA, GLB, EIEIO. I mean, it's coming from everywhere. And uh, you're probably not immune, just like these dealers were not immune, because you've probably seen in the press, Mass the Massachusetts Attorney General settles with an auto dealership over deceptive ads to the tune of uh, $225,000. And this is a, a May article. Another one, an Ohio Attorney General files suit against two buy here, pay here dealers, and they're probably facing the same penalties. And they've been uh, charged with failing to notify customers of payment due dates, failing to notify customers of the total cost of credit. Classic compliance stuff. So if you admit that you might not be totally bulletproof, let's talk a little bit about how you become bulletproof. And if you understand the risks, you need to first do a self-assessment. You need to look in the mirror and, and determine, are your F&I people or the people that are interfacing with the consumers on a daily basis aware of the regulations? 
You, know, you may think they are, but they may not be. And I'd like to refer you to uh, the Association of Finance and Insurance Professionals. AFIP.com has a really great self-assessment quiz. It's like a, a 10 question multiple choice uh, thing you can do right on the web to kind of get a, a, a temperature of how compliant your F&I people are. It's a great place to start. Once you agree that there's a little work to be done, there are plenty of resources available that you could take advantage of to, to, to try to get educated. And some of those things include you know, AFIP certification through the Association of Finance and Insurance Professionals. For those of you that were in the last session, Mr. Hudson is a author of uh, Car Law, the F&I Legal Desk Book, the fourth edition, which is an awesome source for compliance in plain speak. And that's also the textbook for the AFIP certification course. So take advantage of those things. Also organizations like NIADA, I mean a wealth of information and industry lobbies that, that are out for your best interest. And don't forget to take a look at the FTC and the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Board uh, websites also because they will give you plain speak language on how to become compliant and give you resources as well. But the fact that you're attending conferences like this is a great first step to attain that education. And I, in, in respect for an attorney on our panel here, I also want to let you know that you must check with your legal counsel. You are going to decide on the business rules and create the processes, but please have your counsel review and, and, and approve of those, uh, the procedures so that uh, he can help you immunize or, or make you a little more bulletproof. And uh, before I turn it over to, uh, to Chip, Chip, the other gentleman here, I just want to make a note that there's a lot of software out there today, including Route 1, you know, that, that offers compliance tools and, and, and things that help automate some of the drudgery associated with some of the compliance tasks. And I think you're going to agree, there's no software out there in the market that's going to make you compliant. No. The only thing that's going to make you compliant is your process and your discipline in the dealership to get educated, trained, and act accordingly. So uh, can, with that. Can I ask a question? Yes. You know, a lot of the cases we read, you, you see the summary and you say, how can that, how can that result be? And then you start reading the facts, and it, it sounds as though there might be a disconnect between the person who's out on the lot and is talking with the salesperson, and, and they're saying one thing, and then you get into the F&I office, and something else is happening. What, what are your thoughts on maybe um, best practices to, to coordinate to make sure that they're saying the same things, they're on the same page? And, and that, that's a tough one. And again, I, I will steer everybody to resources like AFIP and strongly encourage the certification program they offer because I, I think it, it's, it's state of the art. It's as close as you're gonna get to getting the education that you need to be able to motivate and, and educate your employees to do the right thing and have a consistent message with, you, with each consumer. And it's more what you don't know than what you and, do. And what we, right. what, we, what we stress is integrating, and I'll get into this, but integrating compliance with your sales process. Don't just train your F&I, train your salespeople on compliance. They should know what red flags and every, everything that has to do with compliance from a sales standpoint, they should know. So, um, Absolutely. So that's, that's kind of what, and I'll get into that a little bit more. But, Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, like he said, uh, like the moderator said, my name is Corby Swick. I'm the VP of Sales with uh, ProMax and uh, ProCredit Express. And the topic is, is your, is your, uh, your F&I bulletproof? And as he was talking, I contest, and I think he agrees, that if your compliance policy isn't bulletproof, your F&I is not bulletproof. Um, what I'm going to discuss are some things that dealers, that I've noticed dealers uh, neglect, with compliance, you guys work very hard for the profits that you make in F&I. And all of that can be wiped out with one compliance incident. Um, the, first, the first thing I'm going to discuss a little bit, and I know that uh, Tom Hudson went over it, is the, uh, the Frank Dodd Act. And the reason I bring this up is because it's really changed buy here, pay here, and the NI, and, uh, independent dealers. Um, no longer, as he was saying, no longer can you guys say, I'm a small guy. They're just going to go after the franchise dealers. Because the, the Frank Dodd Act created a new agency called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And if you don't sell all your paper and do service, you fall under the jurisdiction of the Consumer Financial Protection, or uh, 
Protection Bureau. And they are very well funded, they have a lot of power, and they're new. So uh, I, I would think that they're gonna be out looking uh, to make an example of somebody. They're new, so they're just getting going, but I think next year we're gonna see a lot more of those articles and papers. And the auto industry with that Frank Dodd Act has become one of the most uh, regulated industries in the country. And so it's really time to take uh, compliance seriously or you could lose a lot of your profits that you're making. So what do you, what do you think they're gonna ask you if you come into, if, if the FTC or the uh, CF, uh, or the, uh, the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau comes into your store? I'm not gonna list all the things they're gonna ask, but I know for a fact, one of the things they're gonna ask is who is your compliance officer? And the other thing they're gonna ask is, can I see a copy of your identity theft protection protocol or your safeguard policy? Because the safeguard rule that was passed, that was a law that was, that was put in place and then they kept putting it back and putting it back and putting it back, and I see so many dealers who just forgot about it and never wrote their policy. And that is where you're really gonna get nailed if somebody walks through your door. Because the safeguard rule states that you have to have a written policy in place that describes how you're going to protect and secure consumer data. And there are five elements to the policy that you have to cover. Designate an employee, a compliance officer, identify reasonable, foreseeable internal and external risks to security and provide ongoing training in those areas, implement consumer information safeguards to control the risk you identify. You must oversee all provider, service providers who take possession of consumer information, and you must evaluate and adjust your information security program on an ongoing basis. So this isn't something that you can just write and throw in a desk drawer. You have, that, it has to be evolving, and your compliance officer is the one who has to stay up with the laws that are coming out. And there's more and more coming out every day. Um, like I said, we suggest that you integrate compliance into your sales process, into your desking process, and into your F&I process. There's a lot of technology out there, as uh, the, the gentleman from out one said, there's a lot of technology out there that can help you automate compliance. So we suggest that you have a system that can scan a driver's license and store a driver's license electronically. What better way to prove identity than to have a, a electronic copy of a person's driver's license? When you scan that driver's license, the system, your system should print a, a privacy notice, run an OFAC. A lot of dealers today are running OFACs when they run a bureau, but would you rather have, would you rather know that that person is a terrorist or a drug dealer before he gets in your car? Use the credit bureau company's technology to help you identify red flags. They're very inexpensive. It's a safeguard for you to make sure that somebody is not trying to uh, commit identity theft. Make sure that you're printing your risk-based pricing letters. And I would suggest that you have whoever, whatever company you're using has a safeguard in place. If you guys are busy on a Saturday, make sure that risk-based pricing is part of your F&I process because if they deliver a car, you have to give it to them at the time of delivery, a risk-based pricing notice. But if they don't, you have 30 days. On a busy Saturday, you might let a few slip through the cracks. You should have a safeguard in place where your company will mail those out for you. And lastly, oh, uh, adverse action notices. How many in here are doing adverse action notices right now? If you didn't raise your hand, that's one thing that I hear more dealers tell me that's the job of the lender and it is completely untrue. Uh, if you're selling paper, you're making adverse actions every day. If the customer comes in, they only have $1,000 of income, uh, they only got one month on their job, whatever it may be, you're, there's multiple ways you can make adverse action and that's one area that I would stress to anybody that's not doing it to look in and educate yourself on adverse action. And if you do those things, even if you get audited, I'm not an attorney, I don't work for the FTC, but we have had dealers audited if you're doing all these things, they will slap you on the hand, but they're not going to throw the, you know, they're not, they're not going to come down hard on you. They're going to let you know some areas that you have to improve, and 
you should be okay. But if you're doing these things, you're gonna make, you're gonna involve and you're gonna make your compliance policy bulletproof and therefore you'll make your, uh, your F&I bulletproof. Chip? You know, just, just to add to the red flags requirement, you know, you're subject to lots of regulatory requirements and the red flags rule and requirements are one that uh, instead of kind of grumbling to say, boy, I need to comply with this, this is just another thing, you know, it really is, supports good business practice. So being able to identify those risks, um, have in place a, a way to identify red flags that might suggest identity theft, having a way to spot, spot those things, deal with them, and respond to them, that's just good business practice. So it's, it's, I think, on a short list of regulatory requirements where you can say, you know, this is helping me by complying with this regulation. This is helping me and my business. Uh, and not all regulatory requirements are like that. So that, that's one that uh, kind of serves a double purpose. You're satisfying a regulation, but you're also helping your business. Chip, let me ask you, when uh, we look at conventions, let alone the NIADA convention, look at any gathering, a lot of emphasis has been placed on the legal issues. There was a time when the internet was the talk of the town of conventions. And then uh, you have fuel efficiency, uh, electric cars. Why all of a sudden all of this emphasis, or is it all of a sudden, or this illusion that the law is here? I, I'd say it's always been here, but Dodd-Frank has a lot to do with that. You know, you, you shake up the whole regulatory scheme by having a, a new sheriff in town, and not only a new sheriff, but in this industry, kind of two sheriffs. You have the FTC and the uh, Three, CFPB. The, the, uh... you, you also have attorneys general in, in the various states. You also have state Federal states Federal laws. Board. You have uh, your buyers and private causes of action. You know, you just have one more sheriff, but a big one and a well-funded one. Is anyone here AFIP certified? AFIP, the Association of Finance and Insurance Professionals, we have an AFIP certified person here, uh, has been around for several years. Uh, as the past chairman of North University's automotive department, uh, we actually made it a requirement uh, of our finance insurance class. Students actually had to take the AFIP exam. It was actually part of the curriculum. Uh, we, that's how important we felt it was. So when you think about answering the question about as Chip mentioned, what do you do about the salesperson saying one thing on the lot, and then all of a sudden management has a different connect inside the dealership? One of the ways to perhaps solve that problem is through AFIP certification through everyone uh, in the dealership. Uh, if you haven't looked up AFIP, do so. It's A F I P, AFIP. Uh, the fellow that you talked to is Dave Robertson. Dave and I are, are friends way back. Uh, and I got to tell you, it, it, the curriculum is intense, and if you're not sure whether or not you should invest in it, I gotta tell you, uh, Pat hit it right on the head. Go online and take the free test. There's only a handful of questions, but after taking the test and you're shaking your head, pick up the phone, go online, and sign for AFIP. Uh, that alone should get your attention. I tried taking that test the first time, and even I did not do well uh, the first time. I realized there's some things I thought I knew uh, until I went back and read the book and realized there's some things I, I need to brush up on. But it's amazing uh, how something that's simple and free online can do it. And don't argue about cost. <laughs> it's one of the things that drives me crazy is, uh, I don't know if you gentlemen agree or disagree, is uh, dealers saying, well, every time I turn around, there's something else I have to buy. And uh, I know you make these decisions between the inflatable gorilla and a law book. <laughs> and I have to admit, the gorilla is a lot more fun. Uh, and I will tell you a story. I was at the NADA convention. Uh, actually, I was at the NADA convention doing a presentation for the franchise dealers. And I walked on the convention floor. And I had met uh, Tom. Tom had been friends for many years. And Tom was actually uh, attempting to hand out, and I say attempting to hand out free of charge, his book, Car Law. And I was absolutely flabbergasted how many dealers say, what do I need a book for? <laughs> Yet they ran to the next table picking up the squeegee balls, the caveman <laughs> plastic bats, and the light-up badges. Uh, but they actually turned down that Tom's book free of charge. And uh, that mentality just absolutely scares me to think that as hard as you do work, and uh, I certainly think Corby hit on the head, and uh, Pat, you, you work so hard for your dollars, and it all could be eradicated with one major fine. 
not to mention a headache. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of dealing with your government. <laughs> Tom mentioned the 300, uh, just one that was 300,000, that one came up in the last session that was $300,000. How hard would that hit anybody in here? $300,000 fine for a compliance issue? And for those of you CMDs, take $300,000, divide that by about 4% net on sales, and see how many sales dollars you'd have to generate to recover that. That's big bucks. Yeah, I just wanted to add a footnote on the training, because uh, you know, Route 1 is active in about 19,000 franchise and independent dealers nationally. And we were talking to a dealer just on this topic, and he was pushing back about the expense associated with training. And, and his argument was, Pat, why should I make the investment in training when these guys are probably going to leave? And we posed the question back to him, well, what if you don't train them and he stays? <laughs> you know, come on. Yeah. So, I mean, the AFIP certification, I think you can, you can procure for under $1,000. I think, uh, Correct, yeah. yeah, it's just $900, and places like Route 1, you can go and get a discount. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a worthwhile investment, but it starts with the education. And, and if there's anything you take away from this, from my perspective, it's, it's seek out the education to make sure that uh, you, uh, you, you, don't, you can't say that you don't know what you don't know. You will know. Many of my friends here at NIDA are pretty much the chief cook bottle wash. They do everything. It's a one-man show, maybe a two-person show. And I got to tell you, if I were a one-person operation or it was just me and my spouse uh, working uh, all these hours, I have to tell you, there, to me, there would seem to be an overwhelming sense of a, a legal tsunami. Uh, and I, sometimes I get overwhelmed at the fact that there's all these legal issues, and every time I turn around, there's something in automotive news or something in used car dealer news about someone being sued. At what point do I just say, to hell with the business? I can't keep up. Is there any advice for a smaller dealership and how to cope with all of these legal issues? Well, I, you know, to that end, uh, in preparing for today, I thought instead of creating a laundry list of things to think through, let's just talk about one, one topic. So if I can defer your question for a moment, the, you know, the, the topic I'd like to talk about is arbitration. Um, you know, at a, at a conference a month or so ago, the question was asked, should we or shouldn't we have an arbitration agreement or provision in our sales transaction? And to which I responded, well, the, the extent to which courts uh, are upholding arbitration agreements varies from jurisdiction, your business, the size of your business, the type of customers you have, your methods of, of resolving disputes probably vary dramatically. You know, I don't think there's a one size fits all. And, and after I said that, the panelist next to me, who's, who's in our audience, Terry, said, no, I think, I think every dealer should have an arbitration agreement in their contract. And, and we didn't have time to kind of explore wh what does that mean? What, what, a, what thought process do you go through to make this decision? So I was thinking today we could, uh, um, could just run through that thought process and, and, and not to talk about a legal analysis, this case says one thing, another case says another, but really more from a, a kind of idea or a practical perspective to kind of think through the arbitration question. So uh, as, as I think about arbitration, it's really just another way of solving a dispute you have with your customer. You have a lawsuit, the civil, civil court system and lawsuits. Uh, or is there some other, some other way that you can resolve disputes? And for years, the marketplace has been, and, and uh, attorneys and businesses have been looking for alternative ways to resolve that dispute. And, and to put something like that together, you want to make sure that it's comparable or has some of the same features as a lawsuit. So you'd want to make sure that you have confidence in the result, that it's a, you're going to have a, a fair opportunity to be heard, a fair analysis, you have some confidence that the, the decision will be well-reasoned. You want it to be at least as fast as the court system. You'd like it to be uh, inexpensive if you, if you can have, uh, keep the costs down compared to a civil lawsuit. And, and one additional piece that's maybe a little different from a lawsuit is that oftentimes uh, businesses in looking for an alternative want to have a solution where they can resolve a dispute with someone else and not be in the public eye. So you resolve your dispute privately. So, so for years, the business and legal communities have tried a number of experiments. And the one that seems to have fared very well or best in the consumer context is arbitration. So uh, arbitration is 
uh, a situation where both parties agree they're going to bring in an outsider, they're going to state their case, and the, arbit the arbitrator, this outsider, is going to make a decision, and both parties agree they're going to live with it. That's different from mediation, which is another form of alternative dispute resolution, where both parties agree to bring in a third party, and that third party kind of helps them get together, talk about their issues, and helps bring them to some settlement or some, uh, some resolution. The mediator doesn't create that resolution. You may twist some arms, but it's the parties who come to that uh, resolution. But, but the winner in these days seems to be arbitration. So when courts have looked at consumer arbitration agreements, oftentimes you'll see, no matter what the facts are, if the court says there's something wrong with this arbitration agreement or provision, what they generally will find fault with is those key elements of is this, a, is this decent or comparable to the, the alternative, which is a civil lawsuit. So is, is there this expectation of fairness? It's set up so that the parties are going to be heard. It's going to be re it's, uh, likely and set up so that it, it, you'll get a reasoned decision and a fair decision. Is it less expensive? Is it, efi is it efficient? And, and the courts that are saying, no, this, this arbitration agreement is unenforceable or it's invalid, they're saying there's something wrong with it. It's, it's, there's a, uh, such an imbalance of those features that we, can't, we just can't enforce it. So in response to that, you'll see in the industry, and if, if you have an arbitration agreement, I would encourage you to read it or read any other arbitration agreement that, that you see in the marketplace. Look, look for the key elements that kind of set up this balance of fairness so that both buyer and seller, for example, uh, are, meeting the, are, are feeling like this is a decent alternative to a lawsuit. So you'll see when you, when you read agreements that, um, that are well drafted, you'll see that they'll allow either party to say when there's a dispute, I want to arbitrate this. And when one of the parties says, I want to arbitrate, the other one has to go along. But both have that power to say, I want to arbitrate. And, wh and when there's an agreement to arbitrate, then there's typically going to be a provision that says the parties have to get together and together they decide on the arbitration association or the arbitration service provider so that they both have that power. And, and then you use the rules of whatever arbitration association or service provider uh, you agree to. And then both parties go through a process of selecting the arbitrator. So you, know, you have this continual uh, set of rules setting up a structure where everyone's uh, in, involved and it's fair. Then it comes to fees. Who's going to pay for it? And you would typically expect a provision that says both parties are going to share equally the cost. But when you have a buyer who might say, gee, I don't have any money, I'm out. I, I can't afford to arbitrate. The response to that, to keep this as fair as possible, is you oftentimes have a provision where the, the dealer or the seller agrees to front the costs. Everyone shares, but the dealer's going to front the costs up to a certain amount. And that keeps both parties in the game. You may also agree that at the end of the arbitration, the arbitrator gets to decide ultimately how to share the costs of the arbitration. But at least you're, you're structuring it so that you have this semblance of fairness and everyone's in the game. Uh, then you also have, uh, likely have a provision that if one party doesn't like the result, there is some form of appeal or a second chance mechanism. You're staying in arbitration, but there's a, a second chance. And then, of course, you'd have the, uh, a provision that says, once we agree to arbitrate, nobody gets to jump out and go off and run to the courthouse and file a lawsuit. Once we agree to arbitrate, that's where we are. And, and that has the function or functions in a way that means a uh, buyer, for example, isn't going to go to the courthouse, file a lawsuit, and uh, potentially file a class a start a class action lawsuit against you. That, that also means an, a provision where we say the both parties agree to resolve this dispute uh, privately as through arbitration, meaning we can't join have other people join the arbitration, meaning meaning we can't have a class action arbitration uh, resolution either. It's just between the two parties. So sometimes you get it wrong. You read, you know, you're reading in the um, press or in other places that ar arbitration is all about preventing class action. That's an important feature. It's an important risk mitigation feature, uh, no doubt. But if that's all you're focused on, you're getting it wrong. 
if that's all you're focused on, then you're more likely to, to agree to terms in an arbitration agreement that are somehow out of balance that ultimately the court is going to find fault with. So it, it's important to think a big picture. Arbitration is another way of solving, resolving a dispute. Yes, there is uh, risk mitigation uh, for dealers who can avoid class action uh, exposure or a potential, but that's, that's not the big picture. The big picture is here's another way of solving a dispute. So, so getting to kind of the ultimate question, should I or shouldn't I, you know, I, I think if you don't have an arbitration provision, what are your ways of solving disputes now if you don't have one? And, and one way might be when a customer comes in, we sit down, we talk about it, we resolve our, we, we try to resolve our disputes and that's the end of it. It doesn't get to be formal, it doesn't get to be any more than that. We deal with our customers, relationships are important. Uh, another possibility is when the customer, com customer isn't paying and we have a dispute, uh, we, we repossess the car. I don't need an arbitration, I don't need a lawsuit, I re repossess the car. And, and that's true whether you have an arbitration agreement, a well-drafted arbitration agreement or not, by the way, is you repossess the car. And sometimes when you, once you repossess the car, it, that, that's it. it. That's the end of the dispute. Uh, it's also possible that if, if the value of the car or the amount in dispute is under a threshold amount, say typically five to $7,000, your state might have a small claims court or a conciliation court kind of like a Judge Judy setup where both parties agree, they, they go to court, they state their, their arguments, and the Judge Judy decides, and, and that's that. And, and typically in those situations, as in Ju Judge Judy TV show, people would typically come uh, without counsel, unrepresented. Uh, it's very simple, very informal, but you get, your res you get resolution to your dispute. So all of these things are available, and available to you, whether you have an arbitration agreement or not. You might, might also um, note that even if you don't have an arbitration agreement in your retail sales contract, you can still agree after a dispute arises. Both parties can say, hey, let's, let's mediate this. Let's hire a mediator and resolve it. Or let's arbitrate. Or let's just sit down and try to resolve it. And, and that's available whether you have a contract provision or not. And then finally, if it comes to a lawsuit, uh, what, once the lawsuit is initiated, the parties can agree to settle. They can still both come together and say, let's mediate, let's arbitrate. So you have all kinds of opportunities, all kinds of tools in your toolbox to solve dispute, to resolve disputes, whether you have an arbitration ag agreement or provision or not. And hopefully you're making use of all of those tools already. So if you don't have if you don't have an arbitration agreement, you still have a pretty full, pretty full toolbox. But, but I think here's the point. If you have a well-drafted arbitration agreement, one that you feel comfortable with, one, you, one that you think is fair, one that you think if the buyer says to me when we get in a dispute, I want to arbitrate, you'd feel okay with that just as much as you want the buyer to feel okay if you say uh, we, the dealership, want to arbitrate. If, if you're set up that way, then you've got one more tool in your toolbox. And it's unlikely that it's gonna bite you or harm you to have one more tool in your toolbox. Maybe the worst that could happen would be you, you or the buyer re, uh, request arbitration in a dispute and you go to court and argue about whether the arbitration provision is enforceable and you lose. Then, you, then you're in civil court, you've spent a lot of time and money arguing about arbitration and you've lost it, and you're kind of out, out a lot of time and money and you're still in court. That's probably the worst that can happen. But having an arbitration agreement uh, provision doesn't mean you have to arbitrate all the time. It just means one of the parties uh, chooses under the circumstances to request arbitration. Chip, and if I may, in lieu of time, let me sure get questions in. Is there any questions at this point? Questions? There we go, right here. I'm gonna make uh, Georgia run. <laughs> no, what we can do is there's a microphone right behind you. Yeah, just stand right there, right there. Oh, I didn't know, by the way, was Judge Judy actually is an arbitrator. That the show, she's actually an arbiter, <coughs> and that the uh, settlements are paid for by the TV show. Hmm. So I could ask my wife, why would people get on TV and display themselves like that? 
So if you're thinking free advertising. Publicity, right? Uh -huh. um, hello, my name is Michael Ropo. Um, we do quite a bit of compliance work in the area of New Jersey for about maybe 350 Would you speak closer to the microphone so we can all hear? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we do compliance work for uh, about 350 dealerships in, in New Jersey area, New York area, and Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work, a lot of words basically based on best practice as far as compliance. That, that was a great word. Um, shiny objects like software, <coughs> buying shiny objects, and uh, basically having those things in place. And it goes back to the first gentleman that said, hey, you know, what, uh, what if we train them and they leave? That's a great process. Uh, what if the training meant they stay, if you don't train them? And uh, quite honestly, I think the training process needs to go on. And everybody that contributes to that uh, compliance process needs to know the process. And unfortunately, sometimes it's victims like the only person that does the compliance in the dealership, and nobody else knows it. And there's transfer of people, and quite honestly, that doesn't happen. And that's where we see those uh, types of uh, litigation. So just figured I'd comment on your uh, statement. Very good one, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Anything to add, gentlemen? Yeah, and I, I was l listening real hard for a question, and I think I heard one. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I want to reiterate, everything you say is true. I mean, it's, it's, it's muddy, it's convoluted, it's very complicated. And although the laws typically aren't real new, the interpretations may be, right? Or, or new uh, your governing bodies to try to, to enforce some of these actions. So you, you see the same issues I think that we do when we, we talk to dealers every day. It's, uh, you know, it's a lack of awareness, a lack, a lack of a commitment, and a lack of the education and training. And there are resources available, like, like your company, that they can take advantage of. And I, I encourage everybody to do that. It's too late. <clears throat> yeah. It's all about prevention. Other questions? Ah, oh, there we go. My name's Jerry Vogler, and, and I'm from South Dakota, and we've done a, a number of compliance sessions. And uh, by and large, uh, uh, we struggle, like pretty much everyone does, in terms of getting attendance at compliance sessions. Um, it appears to me that, uh, that, that there's a new uh, era about to come into place because what we've experienced in the past is, is the reason that there's a lack of interest in compliance is because there's been a lack of enforcement, okay? The so what of things. Uh, give me uh, two examples, hard examples of uh, concrete examples, if you would, of why that new era is going to come into play and why dealers actually need to take <coughs> note of compliance today. Well, I, I think because most of the fines that come into play with compliance are per occurrence. They're not just a one-time fee. So if you aren't doing certain things, it could be $1,000 per occurrence, it could be $10,000 per occurrence. And I think you're right. I mean, there, there's, there's been a lackadaisical effort on dealerships part because of the lack of enforcement. But I think third, fourth quarter this year, definitely fourth, fourth, first quarter of next year, when the, CFB, the CFPB gets in, gets really its feet on the ground and uh, the FTC boosts up, I think that it's, I talk to dealers all the time and I keep telling them, don't be the example because I, I know that somebody is going to be made the example and until that happens, until a large dealer group gets shut down or we see that a large dealer get, group got fined uh, by the FTC or a, a large buy here, pay here dealer um, that has you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on the road uh, got, a, you know, font, got hit by the, the CFPB, until we see that, it's probably not going to take hold, unfortunately, because it's just it's something that's confusing, convoluted, and dealers don't, don't want to uh, address it. But, uh, don't get caught in that trap because, like we've all said, you work hard for your, your profits. And those can be wiped out. In, and it's all relative. I mean, if you're a huge store, you get a huge fine. If you're a small, smaller store, you get a smaller fine. But what would you say? Divide it by 4%, you can figure out how, how many sales that's going to take to 
to come up. So whether it's 300,000 or 3 million, uh, it's going to hurt you either way. And you don't want to be, you don't want to be caught in that, in that trap because somebody's going to be made the example and then you're going to start getting people to those compliance classes. Chip, let me ask you something, if I may. With, with the advent of blogging, Twittering, tweeting, Facebooking, is it possible that an innocent, irate comment made by an individual made a purchase, would those comments be seen by any legal entity that might trigger an investigation? You know, I, I think Patty mentioned in her presentation that if it's on the web or publicly accessible, the CFPB seems to have its feelers out and to be looking for it. So even though a dealer says, I'm small, I'm little, and that it's not enforceable, would it not make sense for these agencies to pick the low-hanging fruit? You shoved this in my face, I saw it on the internet, I saw some on YouTube, and I've heard some very derogatory YouTube comments made about businesses, various businesses. Surely someone's also checking, and just why not take the easy ones? Well, it, uh, one of the interesting concrete examples, I think the Tom and Patty and Pat, the two mentioned, uh, are the, was the action, the advertising action uh, against five dealers regarding their trade-ins and trade-in value. You know, uh, that, that's a concrete example of, uh, of an ad. If you go out to the FTC website and look at those ads, it's pretty, the infraction is pretty nuanced. I, I read it and reread it and reread it and thought, well, I'm not sure I'm getting what's wrong with this. Um, and so if you go out there and look at it, it's, it, it may be uh, a shock, but it, it, that means there are these nuanced uh, issues in ads and the FTC is out there looking. And, 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 and the, the funny thing was that one of the dealers in response posted a YouTube video to tell its side of the story. So it, was, so it works both ways. Well, I saw a salesperson uh, of several uh, dealerships, by the way, franchise stores, the salesmen and managers had uh, posted a YouTube video on things they were doing in the dealership that were not right. And they posted it. And they thought that was funny. I thought, wow, uh, you know, talk about a suicide mission. They took the time because they thought it was funny of how they uh, high grossed someone and uh, these other practices. I thought, wow. Yeah, when you, when you, when you look at advertising, you really, need to, you really need to educate yourself on the Truth and Lending Act and Regulation Z. Uh, that, that there's a lot to Reg Z, but a lot, it, really, the advertising part and what you can put in an ad and how you have to display payments and interest rates and stuff, and, and that's kind of probably what he was talking about, but Reg Z is, is where you want to look when you're talking about advertising and what you can put on advertisements and stuff like that. And, and Joe, your, your comment suggests it's worth the effort to have an employment agreement with your employees as well, because that right. should be bad behavior that would uh, immediately end your employment if you go on YouTube. You know, even if you, went, even if you had an employee with the best of intentions create a YouTube video to talk about how wonderful the job is and how wonderful their practices are, if you're not seeing it and you're, you're not um, agreeing to it or a part of it, that you don't want You'll it. You'll amaze yourself to find out what you really don't know about your own business. Mm -hmm. Well, Pat, Corby, Chip, our time is up. I want to thank you all for sharing this afternoon with us, and very grateful you made the 4 o'clock meeting. Have some fun. Thank you.